In this video, we're going to take a look at improper integrals, and there are actually two ways that an integral can be improper. In this one, we're going to focus on those with infinite limits of integration. So before we dive in, let's just see why these are improper integrals. Remember that the fundamental theorem of calculus that requires our function to be continuous over the entire domain, and a and b have to be finite values, not infinity. So essentially, if those either of those two conditions aren't met, either it's not continuous over the entire domain, or a and b are infinite values, that makes them improper. So what we're going to do is we're going to get around this by taking a look at limits as our function approaches infinity or negative infinity. So in this video, obviously we're focusing on the first type of improper integral, which is where the function is continuous, but one or both limits of integration are infinite. One thing that we wanna keep in mind as we're looking at these examples is whether or not our area is going to converge or diverge. So for instance, I have a, a graph of this function one over x minus one to the fourth. Now, my integral goes from three to infinity. So we can see where three is on our graph. And we can see that as I move to the right, this is definitely going to converge because that area is getting smaller. So we're gonna look for the limit of that area. Whereas, let's say I was looking at the integral from say negative one to one. We can see that this value is going to keep going up and up and up and up and up and that would diverge. So that's going to be a recurring theme here because if we find that our area diverges, if it continues on towards infinity forever or negative infinity, we won't be able to find a limit. So let's take a look at this first example. And we have a rule for when you have the upper limit of integration of infinity. And essentially what we're going to do is we're just going to replace infinity with b, and then we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus because then b is going to be some finite value, and then we're going to look at the value as b approaches infinity. So it's sort of a taking the long way around, but that's how we can actually do this. So this says we can now take the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from three to b now, so instead of infinity, three to b, and then the same function, one over x minus one to the fourth dx, or let's just go ahead and call this x minus one to the negative four dx. So using the power rule, I know that if I have some value to the negative fourth, then the integral, and I'm going to, you're gonna get really sick of rewriting the limit as b approaches infinity, but you have to keep doing it until you actually evaluate the limit. So the limit as b approaches infinity, and then this tells me I'm going to take x minus one to the negative three divided by negative three evaluated from three to b. So let's clean that up just a little bit. Obviously, x minus one to the negative three, negative three tells me it belongs in the denominator, so I have one over negative three times x minus one to the positive third evaluated from three to b. So now my solution Again, the limit as b approaches infinity, I can't stop writing that until I've actually evaluated the limit. I'm now going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus that says one over negative three times b minus one to the third minus one over negative three times three minus one to the third. All as the limit as b approaches infinity. So here's how this is gonna work out. I have this value that includes a b. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, if b were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, what would happen to that fraction? Would it get bigger and bigger and bigger or would it approach some value? So remember back when we were first learning 
about limits, that if you had one over an increasingly large number, one divided by an increasingly large number approaches zero. So not equals, but it approaches zero. So that's what's going to happen here. The limit as v approaches infinity is this is going to be zero because this guy is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then I'm going to say the other part of my fraction is I can just evaluate because it's all values. So I have one over negative three. Three minus one obviously is two. Two to the third is eight. So I have negative one twenty-fourth. So zero minus negative one twenty-fourth is one twenty-fourth and that's my final solution. And again, we understand that this would be something that converges because if I get a limit, then that means that this value converges. And again, we can verify that by looking at our picture. Let's take a look at a trickier problem now. Not trickier because our rule is trickier, but trickier because my integrand is trickier. So you'll notice here that the rule, it looks really similar to what I just did before. So the only thing that I did different is on the last one, b was infinity. On this one, a is negative infinity. So notice I'm just going to replace negative infinity with a and then find the limit as a approaches negative infinity. Now the reason I said this one's more difficult is because my integrand is going to require me to use integration by parts. And I know that because this is a product of two values where u substitution can't be used because if I took the derivative of e to the negative 4x, I'm going to still get an e um, and that's not going to work with u substitution. So just as a reminder, if I integrate u dv, my result is uv minus the integral of v du. So that's what I'm going to do here, and I'm just going to, that's just going to save till the end. So this is now the integral, or the limit, as a approaches negative infinity of the integral from a to zero, and now I've got to use integration by parts. So let's think about how we could do that. Remember we have u, and then we have to find du, and then we have v, and dv, and I have to assign the values for u and dv. And our goal is to make this value an easier integral to evaluate. So if I choose, and remember my two values in the product are x and e to the negative 4x. So if I were to choose x to be u, then du is just dx. And that makes me really happy because then I don't have any crazy product happening here where I have to use integration by parts twice. So that's the way I'm going to choose it and then e to the negative 4x will go here. So let's think about the integral of e to the negative 4x. Remember that's what I have to do to find v. If I integrate e to the negative 4x, what I want you to do is think about the how to find the derivative. So if I took the derivative of e to the negative 4x, it would be negative 4 e to the negative 4x. And that means I have to account for this negative 4 by saying this is negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x because I need to be able to take the derivative of negative 1 fourth e to the 4x and end up here. And did I accomplish that? Well, this would be negative 4 times negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x. And that, of course, would be e to the negative 4x. So I did accomplish that. So keep that in mind as we move forward because we're going to see that again when I integrate again. So what I have now is the limit as a approaches negative infinity from a to zero um, of actually this part is now just going to be uv, which is x times negative one-fourth e to the negative 4x minus the integral from a to 0 of v du. So that's negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x dx. And so now let's continue. The limit 
as a approaches negative infinity. Notice this guy's not in the integral anymore because we've already integrated that. So I'm just going to write it a little cleaner. Negative 1 fourth x e to the negative 4x. And then I'm going to integrate negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x. And I have to do that same process I did before. So remember, I have to be able to take the derivative of something and end up here. So I would have to have negative, I'm sorry, positive 1 16th e to the negative 4x in order for me to take the derivative and end up here. And so that's going to give me this expression. Now what I've done is awesome because I no longer have any integrals and now I can just start evaluating. Uh, and I forgot one thing here. This guy should be from uh, a to zero. And then now all of this is from a to zero. So I now am going to start evaluating. If, and you could do some simplification on this. It's completely up to you. So if I wanted to then call this limit as a approaches negative infinity, I could take out a negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x, leaving me with x and plus 1 fourth. And it's up to you if you choose to do that. It, it might make it easier. It might make it more difficult. It's whatever you think. So now I'm going to actually, again, keep writing the limit as a approaches negative infinity. I'm going to plug in zero. So I get negative one fourth e to the zero, right, of zero plus one fourth. And then I get minus, plugging in a, negative one fourth e to the negative 4a and then a plus 1 fourth. From here, let's think about what's going to happen. This guy is not dependent on a, so I don't have to worry about the limit as a approaches negative infinity of the first part of my expression. I get negative 1 fourth times e to the 0, which e to the 0 is obviously 1, times 1 fourth. So my first part is negative 1 16th. Now I have to look at this portion. So minus what? I have negative 1 fourth e to the negative infinity times negative infinity plus 1 fourth. So essentially what I'm going to end up with is negative infinity because no matter even what this is, this is negative infinity. So I've got, I've got some value times a negative infinity and that's going to give me it's actually a negative, negative infinity, which means I'm subtracting infinity. So what does that tell me? That tells me that this diverges. There's no way for me to find that solution. And let's take a look at our graph because I didn't do that at the beginning because I wanted us to discover that it diverges. But if you look at the graph and you think about the fact that I'm going from negative infinity up to zero, we're talking about all of this area under the curve and we can see as we continue to the left, that value is just going to keep growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So it makes perfect sense that this diverges. Let's take a look at this last example now where we are evaluating an integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, which can get a little bit tricky because Again, we really can only deal with one infinity at a time. So we're essentially going to choose a value for C where we're going to cut our integral in half. And if you had a value in your integral that uh, say was an asymptote, so if you had an asymptote, that's where you would choose it. I'm going to choose the value of C at zero um, because zero is a really easy number to work with. So. Let's take a look at how I could split this up. I'm going to make this half my yellow side and this half is going to be blue. So as I'm working, I'm going to keep with that color scheme to help us remember what's going on. So I'm going to write this as the integral from negative infinity to zero of four over 16 plus x squared dx and then 
plus the integral from 0 to infinity of 4 over 16 plus x squared dx. For each of these now, I'm going to use the rules that we've learned on the last two examples. So this first one is going to become the limit as a approaches negative infinity of the integral from a to 0. So that's, again, how we get around that infinity from a to 0 of 4 over 16 plus x squared dx. And this one is going to be the limit as b approaches positive infinity of the integral from 0 to b of 4 over 16 plus x squared dx. On the left hand side, and again, you're going to get sick of writing the limit as each value approaches infinity or negative infinity, but you have to keep writing it until you actually evaluate the limit. So from here, I'm going to take a look at how would I integrate 4 over 16 plus x squared dx. So here I would think about a being 4 and u being x, and so I essentially have an arc tangent pattern that I'm dealing with. So this is the limit as a approaches infinity of the arc tangent or inverse tangent of x over 4 evaluated from a to 0. And then I have plus the limit as b approaches positive infinity of the exact same function, arc tangent x over 4 evaluated from, uh, I'm going to make it look the same as the other one, evaluated from 0 to b. So I have to keep writing the limit until I actually evaluate the limit. So the limit is a approaches negative infinity, and this is arc tangent or the inverse tangent of 0 over 4 minus the inverse tangent of a over 4. And this is the limit as b approaches infinity of the arc tangent of b over 4 minus the arc tangent of 0 over 4. So essentially we're saying what value of tangent gives us a value of 0? And that means this guy, oh, let me not use blue there. This guy, arc tangent of 0 over 4 is 0 on both of those instances. So the only values that I'm really concerned about are negative arc tangent of a over 4 and arc tangent of b over 4. And so you might be thinking, well, how do I do that? Because essentially what we're saying is what value of tangent, tangent of what is going to give me, in this case, negative infinity over 4? So what value of tangent approaches negative infinity? And over here we're saying what value of tangent approaches positive infinity? Now, Hopefully you're familiar, very familiar, with the graph of tangent and you know where those asymptotes are. We are going to be looking at the interval from negative infinity to positive, or sorry, from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so I can see that at negative pi over 2, this is an asymptote. And at positive pi over 2, this is an asymptote. This guy is approaching negative infinity. This guy is approaching positive infinity. So that's what's going to happen here is this is, that's a minus sign here, and then arc tangent of negative infinity is negative pi over 2. And then this is as b approaches positive infinity, so this is infinity, arc tangent of infinity, which we've decided is pi over 2. So I have negative negative pi over 2, or pi over 2 plus pi over 2, which is pi. And again, it makes sense that this converges. 
Again, just by looking at the graph, we can see that, that it should converge and I should end up with a value. Up next, we're going to continue looking at improper integrals, this time with infinite discontinuities.